The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today we get to explore one uh, of the use cases where there's actually a lot of activity going on in blockchain technology, trade finance. We also have, I think, at least two of the groups for final projects are doing things on trade finance. There might be some that haven't uh, disclosed that to me, uh, or after today might shift to it. You never know. Um, and uh, uh, I think eight or 10 of you actually uh, wrote your individual pieces today. So. There's 15 or 20 of you that have been spending a lot of time on trade finance. And I think the reason is, is that there's a lot of application of the underlying technology. And that's what I'm going to try to do uh, uh, today is, um, and then hopefully get the help from the two groups that have some final projects in this regard. Um, and, and, and so many of you that uh, uh, wrote on this today going to go through uh, readings and study guide. What, what is trade finance? So we're going to ru run through. I'm going to give you a little sense of what trade finance is from my perspective. Um, and, and, and then we're going to just go into the blockchain uh, projects themselves. So uh, we'll skip through these because we're going to be chatting about what attributes that trade finance really has. Well, Alpha, you have a group. What, what attributes is trade finance? What attracted you to this? Um, a multiple stakeholders that are changing or transferring data and information. So two things that I just heard. Multiple stakeholders transferring a lot of data. Anybody else? What other attributes? So there's a lot of paperwork that has been transferred between the importer, exporter, and the banks, issuing banks and beneficiary banks. So, so not only is it data, but it's still actually a lot of paperwork. Yeah. And actually, in often times, actual physical paperwork. There are still companies, I mean, they, they, they're not as persistent now as they were years ago, called document couriers. They literally brought the documents around the globe. You have different regulations in different countries. So it's hard to see that you trust one central authority that it's going to give you all you need on, on, on the trial. Right. So a lot of different regulatory regimes, but also uh, different countries. So you have some information asymmetries and, and thus issues of trust across those jurisdictions. Along the lines of issues of trust, there's often a lot of fraud that goes with it as well. A lot of counterfeiting and uh, double financing issues that come right. space. So a lot of fraud and s s double f spend, or in trade finance, it has another term, actually. Anyway, it's double financing. But it's basically the same conceptual framework as a double spend. Uh, can I fi finance one set of goods, one, one cargo being shipped across the Atlantic or Pacific, can I fund it twice? Um, and so that's, that's a bit of the fraud. And also because of the high cost and also all the due diligence, like small, small and medium enterprises are having a very hard like, time getting it like, because of the financial crisis and also all the terrorist attacks. So do you think that small and medium-sized enterprises have a difficulty for the reasons you just said because of terrorist attacks and so forth? Or is there something more broadly that's gone on maybe even for centuries? Uh, new hand here. I don't know, it's more like a problem of like, small financing that they don't have access to the final financing needs like right. they require, their business requires some pretty like, large enterprise. And I can't tell whether it's a hand up or you were fixing your hair. Um, well, the, but, Both, um, okay. Yeah. So um, I was going to say, so small businesses often just like don't have the resources administratively to deal with paper, paperwork, so often the burden, the operational burden becomes so costly for them that it is no longer like actually profitable for them to trade. Right. And also small businesses, if you wanted to add. Well, they just don't have the credit history. Right. So yeah. banks tend to not want to finance them because okay. they just don't trust them. Right. And then we'll... I just want to put some numbers to make it clear to everybody. I was looking at um, 
a study for the Asia Development Bank is saying that small and medium-sized enterprises uh, are the most credit constrained. Around 50% of their demands are being rejected by banks for trade finance, whereas 7% to multinational corporations. So, so small and medium-sized enterprises also are smaller. They're not as well known. And, and your trade finance, by, just by definition, is cross-border. It's cross-jurisdiction, cross-country. How does somebody in the US know a small business in Kenya? Or pick, pick your countries, China and Mexico. Um, so there's a lot of information challenges. Uh, that's been the history of this business for a long time. Um, We'll, we'll hold off on the ongoing projects, but we'll come back to that. So uh, we had a bunch of readings. I updated this uh, because it's, it's uh, um, ever-changing. And I hope that if you had a chance to dig into the, the, the Bain, Bain review, um, I thought as these writings go, it was probably a little better than some of I'm sorry for any of you going into consultancy, Tom. You know, but. But, but as these things go, I thought it was better than some of the Deloitte papers and PwC papers that are still quite helpful, but I thought this was a little bit more uh, detailed. Um, so what is, what is the background, the economic background? This is just from, uh, I think I pulled this from some World Bank uh, figures. Um, uh, worldwide exports of goods are $17 trillion. Services are five or six trillion. But trade finance is really around the exporting of goods more than services. I'm not really familiar with it in the service context. Um, and uh, manufacturers, 12 trillion. Uh, fuels, agriculture, you can see the. the so that's, that's basically the, the, the body of it. Um, and the financing, international finance, and I purposely use words, this is the financing of international trade can come in two different ways. Um, one is if the bank is guaranteeing something or the bank is supporting it through the documents. This is the traditional definition of trade finance, is uh, letters of credits and documentary collection. Anybody want to tell me what, a letter of what the difference of these two things are? Since we've got a whole bunch of people, uh, it's a hand up. Credit is a formal letter from a bank, just laying out the terms of credit extended to, let's say, an expert. Okay, so it's a formal letter laying out the terms, but uh, critically, what is it doing? It removes counterparty risk. Move the counterparty risk away from your set or your buyer to the bank. All right. So it removes counterparty risk. It's guaranteeing payment. But there is a second form that banks support this market in a very big way is documentary uh, collection. Anybody familiar with uh, DCs? Basically, the banks <laughs> are moving the paperwork, this incredible paperwork around the globe. And we'll, we'll dive into this a little bit. And they're not, they're not taking counterparty risks. The banks themselves are not guaranteeing the credit but they're performing enormous services in terms of the paperwork. And, and, and in essence, it's documents versus performance or documents versus authentication that goes in. Um, a bunch of different ways, factoring and forfeiting. Not that this is a, a, a quiz on these terms, but these are different terms. <laughs> uh, factoring is when you sell receivables, short-term receivables. Forfeiting is when they're longer term. So they're, they're kind of a little bit the same thing. But one is short term receivables, short term letters of credit. One are longer term. You can actually take import and export loans out, um, uh, which, which are longer term. Um, and they're about a whole inventory and a whole supply chain. You can get financing beforehand, supplier credit. And a new form of our called supply chain financing, where you're really funding the whole supply chain. But we're going to focus primarily on the first two. And most of the blockchain uh, projects in this space are, are focusing on the first two. Um, but international trade also has trade credit. What's open account? What does that mean in any business? 
Well, we're here at Sloan. Somebody's. Aline, I'm not going to call on you. I'm not going to make you. Jake? Uh, in trade, is that when you ship the goods, like prior to payment being due? So, so you ship goods prior to payment being due. So all right. Payment's due like 90 days later. So it's due 90 days later. Open account is what most businesses do. If you just say, I'm shipping something, send an invoice, and it's uh, and the terms might be 2 and 30. You get a 2% discount if you pay prompt, but 30 days. Oh, just open account. Uh, in domestic business, that's how most services are provided and goods are shipped, is open account. It's these international export business uh, that you find it different. Then cash in advance, of course, is what it sounds like. And consignment is all the other way. An exporter would actually ship. You'd put it on your shelves. You wouldn't have to pay. And the exporter continues to have the risk of the sale. Not used a lot in international trade. Um, you can also get public guarantees or uh, insurance. So that's the whole world of these. $17 trillion of trade, only about five or six trillion is thought to be actually using trade credit, letters of credit and documentary uh, uh, commitments, these two main things. Um, so this ranges, it, uh, this gives you a little bit of a flavor. And, and this you can think of is. What's the most secure for the exporter is over here. The exporter is going to have the most security if they get cash in advance. But does an importer like that? Not really. An importer really would rather have consignment, having risk all the way on the other side. Um, consignment would say the exporter takes all the risk. So it's all about commercial terms. But you can think of it as, as the other side of this is the the, the least attractive for the importer is paying cash in advance. The most attractive to the exporter is cash in advance. And every one of these happens somewhere. In a $17 trillion market, $17 trillion of exports, all of this is, is open for negotiation. Uh, but think of the exporter likes this curve and the importer likes this. And as I um, will show in a second, uh, uh, most of the market is in the middle. So now trade uh, finance. Um, exporters, importers, advising banks, and issuing banks. And what you're going to quickly sort of sense is there's a lot of room maybe for blockchain technology because there's a lot of moving parts. By the way, normally if you work at, uh, on a Wall Street or at a commercial bank, you might never touch trade finance. It's just like a department that if you're on a trading floor, you're not really thinking about a lot. Is that, who's worked on a trading floor here? Did you ever think about trade finance? No? But it's a big market. It's a very big market. But the, basically, the importer, you, the exporter and importer sign a contract. That's for the, the sale of goods. It could be oil. It could be agriculture product or manufacturers. Importer then arranges with an issuing bank a letter of credit. The letter of credit is sent to the exporter's bank. Sometimes the exporter's bank puts a second guarantee on it. The exporter's bank might be actually guaranteeing the importer's bank performance. So there's hundreds of different arrangements. But the classic thing is, is that the importer gets a letter of credit to say, look, you don't know me, but you can take the risk, and I get this letter of credit. You exporter will get your money based upon some documents. When you put some documents together and send them to me that you've actually put your oil or agricultural products on a ship. So shipping is a big part of it. The, the second piece of this is how, how do the documents actually go? The exporter then ships something. Um, the shipment usually leads to some documents. And at the time of the shipping, you see number six 
in this little box over here is the exporter, when they ship something, also sends some documents to their bank. Their bank sends it overseas to the bank in Kenya, let's say, <laughs> even though that uh, doesn't have any ports. Uh, Ethiopia, you have ports, right? No, uh, Kenya has ports. Kenya. Kenya has ports? Sorry. You're landlocked? All right, sorry. So I've got it right. So Kenya, I got it wrong, but Kenya's got ports. Um, but the exporter, at the same time they're shipping, will also send the documents, but send the documents to their bank. Their bank sends it to the foreign bank. The foreign bank says, aha, that triggers the condition in the letter of credit. Payment will be made. And payment can be made when you put the goods on the ship. Payment maybe is made when the goods get to the foreign country. Uh, all these arrangements can be different. So this gives you a sense of the change. Letter credits were estimated in 1970 to be about half of all of trade. Now they're about 15%. Uh, World Economic Forum Bain paper that you all had the pleasure of uh, either re reading or skimming. Um, or you'll read it tomorrow. Um, but, but letters of credit's a, a, a big piece of the market. Primary open account has widened uh, as part of the market. I think in part because International trade is probably more dominated by large companies now than in the past. And in the 1970s, even the large companies didn't know if they could trust each other. The larger enterprises, larger multinationals, really would prefer just to trade on open account and extend each other's credit rather than using the banking system to guarantee their credit. But trade finance is still a good, call it 15 to 20% which would still be rather significant numbers. So that's a, a little bit on the sort of questions about trade finance, how it fits in before we start talking about blockchain projects. I think I had uh, one other thing was, here are all the parties that can be involved. And, and just to sort of confuse us all, here's a list of some of the documents. And that's not even a complete list. I went to a legal website to find out what all the different documents you might have. Uh, anybody know what a bill of lading is? It's some kind of uh, receipt from the, uh, from the vessel carrier that is carrying your goods. Uh, and whoever owns that bill of lading has the right to claim the goods. Right. So it's like a warehouse receipt. Remember we talked about some of the origins of money were around warehouse receipts because I might put my corn or wheat or gold or bronze in a warehouse. A bill of lading originally, though the, 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 the definition has moved on over the centuries, the original definition it was, a, it was like a warehouse receipt on a ship. That you, you took your produce or goods and placed it on a ship and you had a bill of lading. Uh, because it was on the ship. And you could actually, just like those original forms of money, warehouse receipts, you could sell a bill of lading or discount it and get money for it. So bills of lading have centuries old, maybe thousands of years of history, similar to warehouse receipts. And in, in essence, you might think of a bill of lading a little bit as a form of money. Um, but. What, what did I list just for fun? 50 different documents. Aline. How easy is it to fake one of these? Say it louder. How easy is it to fake one of these bills and claim someone else's goods? Very good question. So as a point earlier, uh, and again, this goes back centuries, that there's been a lot of fraud around faking a bill of lading or a bill of exchange, uh, a warehouse receipt in, in another uh, effort. Uh, uh, so what you have is you have a lot of forms of notary, well before cryptography, a lot of forms of notary where uh, various transport agents and shippers uh, had to really um, have seals and, and forms of ways to say this was a committed um, Leonardo. Yeah, the, 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 
part of the problem is exactly that each one single piece of those documents are easy to falsify. But that's why the system became so burdensome in terms of paperwork because they started to build a lot of steps to guarantee that you know you can track all those things and make sure to reduce the risk. But it's relatively easy to get one of those things to and it's why many people think this is actually one of the better use cases, better ecosystems for a revised technology similar to blockchain or actually blockchain technology itself. A lot of multiple parties. And though I only listed seven, you can have multiple banks. You can have the importer's bank, the exporter's bank. Between them, you can have a correspondent bank. Right, so at least three banks in the chain, or sometimes even more, uh, freight forwarders, shippers, customs agents in both countries. The question, James. Um, so lots of parties, lots of documents, high chance of fraud, and guaranteeing validation and verification is a big piece of this marketplace. Um, so then the question is, can you put somebody in the middle? See that little blockchain in the middle? Kind of cute. Um, all right, you're going to laugh a little with me. Um, you know, that's the question. So multiple parties involved. Uh, verification is critical to all the workflows and the economics. Uh, and, and it relies on significant document flows. That's the basic, you know, and it's what Today's lecture is really to say, well, whether you're looking at healthcare records, whether you're thinking about commercial real estate, you're thinking about uh, Internet of Things, remind yourself of trade finance because this is probably one of the best use cases, at least for permission blockchains. You can debate whether it could be done on a traditional database, but it's multiple parties. Lots of validation and verification is important an awful lot of different documents, and there's property rights involved. Critically, there's key property rights, because when you're shipping oil on the high seas or shipping any bits of that 17 trillion on the high seas, people want to finance against it. I have one question for me to better understand this. How, how different is this from sending a good from San Francisco to Boston? in the sense that why is it a matter of that we need all these documents and we need to put the documents on the blockchain or can we just get rid of the documents? Why don't we see the same thing in intra-US? Uh... Very good question. Though the word trade finance has come to mean for many decades, maybe hundreds of years, international trade, the same can be true for domestic trade particularly as you're going, as you said, San Francisco to Boston. Um, you could use a letter of credit between a, a, a major domestic manufacturer and a small business in Boston. So, and they might say, I don't want to take, sorry, Joe Quinn, you know. Yeah. But you're, you're, you're that small manufacturer, you're that small entity in Boston, and Tom's not willing to take your credit risk. You could still want to have a letter of credit. It wouldn't be called technically a bill of lading if it's not on a ship, even though that term sometimes is used. But everything back here could happen in domestic trade, but usually doesn't. Most of domestic trade is done on open account, but some of it's done on letter of credit, and especially if, if it's to small businesses. Does that help? Yes, but I'm trying to think, why do we need it in one? in one case and not on the other. There's more, I think it, it's applicable in both. It's more applicable in international trade because you have more, uh, um, more challenges of trust. Uh, I would even say information asymmetries that if you're sitting in China and you're exporting to Kenya, you have less chance to actually know that local community. And your, lo and your bank in China doesn't know them either. And so what was built up to satisfy that, those issues of trust is the banking sector largely picked up that, either guaranteeing the documents or actually guaranteeing the credit. Hugo. There's also something to say for like border control, right? Like 
I know in, in my lab, we've had like waste materials shipped to us internationally. And like customs agents really even care about that. Like that you have to put a price on that, um, even if it has no price. So like, if you could just put something on a car and drive it from San Francisco to Boston, then maybe like, yeah, if you could drive it from Canada to the US, then it would be different from, from shipping it from China to the US. But yeah. like there's a, the, I think the trust issue comes up a lot more when you're dealing with international and uh, regulatory differences between the two places. Yeah. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist in domestic trade. It, it definitely exists in domestic trade. But international trade long ago created a system to address uh, different languages, different cultures, different regulatory regimes, taxing regimes, and it was going on a ship. Even more anti-money laundry. So there's other regulations that is part of the process that complicates it. When issuing the letter of credit, you, may, you need to make sure that you're not breaking any uh, any regulation between different jurisdictions. Part of it will be AML as well, or ABC or whatever. James, but I think looking at that question, it's it seems like we are using a technology in this case blockchain to fit into the existing framework of how things work. But shouldn't the question be flipped and say, hang on a second, do we need blockchain? in a system that is better designed, rather than having 50 different documents and actually thinking about the, the actual problem. I can see the point of the trust that which may need a blockchain solution, but a lot of that, be that trucking receipt, railway receipts, forward cargo receipts, those are historical relics that surely there must be a technology other than blockchain that can solve the problem. Well, maybe, or maybe blockchain technology is just the right technology that's come along in the 21st century to solve it better than initially pieces of paper and, and literally document couriers that had to be trusted uh, to do They've it. They've gone the way of the dodos, right? So, well, well, they whilst, haven't fully gone the way of the dodo. Whilst I think that there's much to be said about blockchain that creates trust in parties that may not naturally trust each other, the problem seems to me is there's a lot of things that doesn't need to happen in this day and age. As you mentioned, domestic mail services, it's between sender and receiver. What happens in between is tracked by UPS or whoever, but what we don't certainly don't see is all that list of stuff whilst it's happening, but it's unnecessary. Well, you, domestically, you, maybe. You might be right. But what's happened well before blockchain technology came along is digitization. But part of the trade can't be dematerialized. See, in the securities business, what we, what we talked about when we talked about clearing and settling of securities, the equity ownership has been dematerialized and it started to happen in the 1970s. The, 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 the legal right that you ha have this cash flow called an equity interest in, in Apple uh, is all digitized. Part of this trade is not digitized. $17 trillion of physical goods on the high seas. So I, th I still think you're going to need something that shows that, there's, that, the, the, that the physical good is made it on a ship or on a cargo vessel of some sort. And so there are some differences. Uh, Eric? Uh, yes, um, just to uh, address uh, the concern of James, that many of the, pro the, the manual process digitization projects fail at the beginning because they actually did that. They kind of try to reflect exactly what happened in the manual offline world <coughs> into the digitized world, which resulted in many inefficiencies. Uh, this is not the case. Uh, and, we're not actually trying to do exactly that offline process using blockchain technology. That's not the alternative. But that also, that actually made me think, and that's I wanted to point out this the, to your argument of the, uh, centralized databases. And centralized databases have been around for more than 60 years. They've been digitizing manual processes for a while. And the question comes is. Why didn't they already digitize these sort of problems? And this, and the, the answer is because this, this trade finance issue has a special characteristics that make it especially suitable for, to be addressed by this specific technology. So that's why I would, I would argue that.
And what do you, and what do you think that specialness is? It's precisely the fact that you have multiple <coughs> uh, stakeholders dealing with information that goes above, uh, among these moving parts, and you have a high cost of trust. So um, what you're actually doing is using blockchain technology permissioned or otherwise to address this specific challenge. And, you're, and you have a property right as well that people often want to borrow still against while it's on the high seas. Um, but I agree, it may well be that, that, that blockchain technology is not the only solution to this. But it does feel like it's a particularly um, fertile area. And we're going to turn right now to some of the projects. And there's a lot of projects in this space. Uh, Aline, and then we'll go on the back to Aviva. Is the overarching goal here to fix the fraud or to fix the complexity? What's the higher goal? Well, it's a really good question. So those working on projects, is it more about fraud or the complexity? So, or so efficiency. Yeah, the complexity, I guess, is a function of the fact that. So you can, you can drive a lot of efficiency, which is to the uh, complexity. Uh, I think that's one of the overarching goals is driving efficiency, uh, but also to lower uh, the, 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 the fraud or the loss to fraud. It's, it's both, but I think it's driven more by the efficiency from my readings of this. Fraud reading. More by the efficiencies. What's the fraud rate? In, in I don't know the fraud rate. It's a good question. Um, we'll see if we can find it out. Uh, Aviva is going to be next. Um, so let's say that trade finance does transition towards blockchain and then in that it's, it's more on the private blockchain. So then how do we solve the problem of interoper interoperability? Uh, can I hold that? Because it's a, it's a very good question that will come up when we talk a little bit about some of the IBM projects, particularly with one of the largest shippers. So I, it's, it's the right question, but we're going to chat about it when we talk about it. Can I talk about some of the projects or was there something? So uh, where are we? Well, there's, there's, there's five big consortium. Two of them you can see are backed on or working on the Corda. That was the R3 Corda that we talked about earlier this semester. Um, two on IBM. Uh, one that's on a, on a Ping An group is not, not, we didn't talk about earlier uh, this year. Um, and so letter of credit uh, approach. Receivables and payment guarantee financing, which is a little bit different. This is, we already have receivables. How do we fund them? Uh, monitoring open transactions and letters of credit. Uh, and then the Hong Kong group is the supply chain record keeping. And just if you want to see it sort of visually, um, this is all the banks that are involved in each of the consortium. Um, and you'll see basically that there's some overlap, I think, uh, unless, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, ING might be in a couple of them. I think two of these consortia maybe have now merged. Um, but it, it goes a little bit. It's not, it's not fully going to answer your question, Aviva. But even if there were five different consortium trying to figure this out amongst different groups of banks, at some point in time to really gain a great deal more efficiency, how do they operate? How do they transact across their platforms? Um, now, they each obviously don't want to give up economic rents. They don't want to give up market power to somebody. They don't want to all of a sudden find out that, that some entrepreneur is charging them so much because they created a network. Because the one, the one consortium that figures this out early on could price pretty close to their cost structure, but later on could you know, price a lot higher and collect a lot of uh, monopoly or economic rents. Um, so I don't know where this will sort out. And I don't even know that they're going to want to solve the interoperability problem amongst themselves. Sean. Uh, one, one interesting uh, kind of finding from the consortia is all of the banks li listed up there are all either Asian bank or European bank. None of the US bank are actually participating. Look <laughs> at okay, US bank, what I call. But do you see JP Morgan Chase? Now, 
who's the largest uh, uh, issuer of trade finance in the world? What's that? It's not the U.S. government, is it? No, no, no. I think it's Hong Kong. I, I think it's HSBC. <coughs> I'm not. I might be mistaken. I think it's HSBC. You think it too is HSBC? Um, but but you're right. The 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 five big Wells Fargo's not on there either, are they? Um, now that doesn't mean they're not working on other projects because here's some other projects. And these aren't the consortium. I'm just giving you a flavor. There's a lot going on in this space. And those of you who are doing final projects, I challenge you to uh, uh, you know, think about these projects and say, well, what are you recommending that's different? You know, that's not just Me Too, uh, in this Me Too Financial, not the other Me Too stuff. Um, but uh, um, uh, India's in interesting to me. There's, there's um, Another consortium that wasn't on that page, uh, and I probably pronounce it wrong, fin Final Cal or Finet Cal? Is, what's that? Finet. Are you familiar with that? No, not much. I just know the pronunciation. It's just the pronunciation. <laughs> Thank you, Protus, to help me out. I needed it. Um, for validation documents and payment. So they're not really saying we're just trade finance, but we're going to validate all the documents. This is, goes more to fraud, Helene, I think, this project validating the documents, saying, yes, they're true and good, and you can lend against these documents. And, and a lot of times these documents are the bills of lading and bills of exchange are le loan, lendable and, and so forth. So a lot of projects. Um, one, I could only find, now there may be others, I could only find one with a token. And I, I put it up there last, Ethereum-based. Consensus, the company that's run by Joe Lubin, who, who was the venture, Canadian venture capitalist who helped back um, Vitalik, Buterin, and Ethereum, Consensus has three, 400 people at least working at Consensus uh, doing Ethereum-based projects. So I was pleased to see I could find one native-based token. But to my knowledge, uh, all of the consortia and all of the ones I listed up there are permissioned blockchains from what I can tell. But I'm curious, those of you who are working in this, um, have you found any uh, native token projects here? There's still uh, V-Verify, which is a, a project from the Media Lab. It's not a, doesn't have a native token per se, but uses permissionless blockchain, existing block, uh, permissionless blockchain infrastructure to gain uh, in the immutability of the Lots of statements to build uh, a warehouse receipts uh, use case. So they're using uh, transactions in the Bitcoin network right now to write. Uh, the but statements. does B Verify have a token? No, no token. It's, it's Henry's project. Yeah. 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 Henry. What's that, Aline? I think they built on top of our, our research from Cecil. No. Okay. Katina. Yes. That's exactly. Right. Yeah. Katina is a, is a precursor. Yeah. Is that your research? That's right, yeah. It's terrific. <laughs> but you're, 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 <laughs> so you're glad to talk to Eric, but you didn't have a token in that. No, you don't need a token. That's the whole point. Like, Bitcoin's out there. It's a great system, and you can build on top of it efficiently to provide immutability to any permissioned app. So right. don't start your smart contract necessarily unless... I don't know, maybe there's a need for that, but in a lot of things it's not. Like digital identity, for example. Oh, yeah. That would be a fair alternative. alternative. But if you had put a token in it and sold it right into this bull market, I guess you wouldn't be sitting in this class. <laughs> well, yeah. But, no, but, I, <laughs> but I mean, that's, I'm, I'm glad you didn't put a token. I'm glad you're here. But I mean, that's part of, like you're saying, you didn't need it as a technological and commercial point is what you're saying. Um, Leonardo. Yeah, I was just going to mention, uh, I happen to know a couple of people working on this project. Which, which one of them? The last one. Could you tell uh, us something about it? Yeah, so I had to dig a little bit into the native token that you mentioned, but most of the trading firms there are petroleum based. So it's Mercuria, Gunvor, very large ship shippers of petroleum. And back to your point, view of ladings. In the commodity space, the petroleum view of ladings mm -hmm. is, are the ones that are most actively traded, and they change hands 
very often what investors at yeah. sea. Actually, if I can add to this, because I learned a little bit about this when I was in the, uh, the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, of the, the bill of lading for oil on the high seas can trade hands hundreds if not thousands of times. But oil coming from the, uh, uh, the, the Strait of Hormoz to Houston might change ownership in a, I don't know how long that takes, a 15 or 30 day trip. Uh, that would be 20 days. 20 day trip. It can cha change ownership hundreds of times. So those documents become tradable goods. And it's not just in theory, it's, it's very much in practice. Um, so the point I was going to make is I suspect that the native token that must be some kind of collateralization against those uh, bill of lading from uh, petroleum bill lading. So uh, Alpha, who I'm trying to remember everybody in your group, what, what yeah. can you tell us about what you're, what you're working on? How are you going to beat all these consortia? I mean, I'm thinking your, you know, your final project's going right. to do better than these, right? <laughs> we're, we're taking the. I, I did approach, give so. these two groups the heads up that I was going to call on them. So this is you know, just, but yeah. We're, we're taking the approach of just being very specific. So we're focusing on a narrow corridor between Chinese exports coming into Ethiopia. And um, so, one, there aren't many people obviously looking at that space, um, at least not yet. But and is it the trade finance side or what I'll call the supply chain side? The trade finance. Right? Trade finance. Yeah. And so we, we think it's particularly interesting around not just Ethiopia, but all of the sort of developing countries in that region because credit and finance is already so limited. And so um, the domestic banking systems are underdeveloped. Uh, domestic bank system in Ethiopia, particularly. Right. And across East Africa, I would say. Um, and so the reliance on trade finance in those import heavy economies, I think, is even higher. So the pain point, I think, is even stronger there. James, did you have a question yeah. for their group? A anybody that has a question for the group, pile in. They'll, they'll take the advice. Well, not specific on this one, but more on a clarification. So I can clearly see that trade finance requires different parties and the ownership of the goods at any point in time on the supply chain is important. But Particularly when it becomes uh, commoditized like oil yeah. and so forth. But from like over over time, a lot of the times I hear about people saying blockchain uh, using in this scenario is mostly on supply chain. Given that they're not really exchanging it for money, are there actually any commercial cases or use cases with genuine useful points about supply chain being on the blockchain? I mean, tracing where my coffee bean came from on a blockchain is pretty useless to me, but people seem to bang on about it. That's a great thing. I can trace back where something came Are from. Are you a coffee drinker? Uh, yes. yes. Not because of your class. No, no, I just said no. You could drink tea to stay awake in my class, too. That's it. But, 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 you, but I just don't understand when people keep talking about supply chain needing to be on a blockchain. I just don't understand why. I mean, trade finance, absolutely. All right, you're sold. Is, wait, before everybody piles in, does anybody have advice for China, Ethiopia trade finance? Well, I'm going to give everybody a chance to pile in at James's question, but <laughs> you're, you're in a China, Ethiopia yeah, trade so finance. The question of the interoperability. I mean, what's the solution for the Ethiopian firms just have to basically buy into whatever system these Chinese firms are using? So China, Ethiopian <coughs> firms of AIDS have to use letter, letters of credit. So that, that's a regulation. Okay. So everything is done completely manualized right now. And so we would offer just something very, very sort of specific, like an e-bill of lading or e-invoicing platform. I feel like a smart contract. My impression is that it would be easier to get the Ethiopian firms to buy into this new system, whereas the Chinese firms may have multiple options, Absolutely. multiple systems. So how would you approach getting them onto your system specifically or being able to utilize your system in conjunction with whatever else they're using? So yeah, so we agree. So you would have to get just the Ethiopian businesses and banks onto the system. Gotcha. And so that they would be sort of our initial customers. Yep. And for any Chinese bank that wants to do business or export to Ethiopia, they have to go through the Ethiopian bank. So inevitably they'd have to go through this. So it sounds like you're trying to build a solution. Your adoption is through the importer side, through the Ethiopian side initially. Right. And then the Chinese exporters would say, well, this is how I get into the Ethiopian market in a more secure, 
maybe more efficient, but certainly more secure way. Other uh, thoughts on this project? I thought there, um, so there was a new consortium that was predominantly Chinese shippers and uh, container companies. That wasn't on that particular. And it's not this. It's, it's not, not the first one. The not people's. Not the first one. No, this one okay. has a couple of Chinese shipping companies. Uh, it's very new. It's like November eighth or 9th or something that it was launched. So it's just getting started. They were looking for vendors and then yeah, it's a new consortium. Yeah. No, no. This is the this is one of the most active and it's remained active, but mostly permission blockchain yeah. technology. But it's the most active and very vibrant and you know, if you had to say probability weighted, there'll be something successful in this space more than maybe some of the other uh, spaces. Um, so who wants to chime into this uh, James's supply chain? Or this you're gonna, you're gonna jump in. So I just wanna tell, here's your, just two examples of some shipping, and I just pulled up five quick examples of supply chain projects. But Eric, you wanna address? James is coffee. You like coffee more than James. Say, I would, I would make an example of coffee, but let's say fruits. We have a, you have a big retailer chain that, and I think the example is ingredients. You have suddenly you have reports of a sudden infection of E. coli in a specific fruit. Okay, so as a, a <coughs> responsible measure, you have to the retailer has to hold off. Actually, has to know which a part or which slot of fruit is, is the one affected. So since the whole process of you know digging in the, the huge pile of paperwork takes weeks, these guys will have to hold off a big bunch of fruit that they will eventually get lost with the you know economical implications of that. Uh, that was an answer then, then, blockchain. So wait, so wait, wait, so let's see. Get it there, no. get it there. <laughs> so <laughs> having, having your supply chain Commit to a blockchain can make you can allow you quickly get information within hours and immediately identify which is the lot that's being affected. Take it out with the decreased uh, economic costs. So we've got sector. at least uh, three other hands. We'll go. Yeah. So, so so I tend to agree with James. So what I've heard the critiques of uh, using blockchain for supply chains for things like blood diamonds or you know preventing counterfeit goods or whatever. Diamonds. We have two. We have a, a De Beers project on yeah, diamonds. Yeah, so I know these guys. Are, I know these guys are doing that. But the, the criticism I've heard is that because these aren't digital native goods, you know, there has to be an interface between the real world and the blockchain. Physical good to the digital good. And what I've heard from critics is that uh, it's at the point of origin that this fraud or counterfeiting or whatever takes place, and it's the point of origin where that data entry needs to be takes place anyway. So it's garbage in, garbage out. Great, we've got a counterfeit thing that's the, but then that passes through the supply chain. So, so we Shimon, Rahim, and then Tom. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take James. So like, oh my God, I need somebody on the other side of James. No, but like, but you, maybe you can help uh, me understand. So, like Walmart, right, is a kind of prime example. They've implemented it, et cetera. Yeah. But basically, if Walmart just said, like, so there's basically they're using IBM infrastructure, right? If they went to the supply chain and said, look, guys, uh, we hired IBM, hmm. okay? Now you're gonna send, every time this, this good kind of transfer hands, you're gonna send that information to IBM. That's it, I mean, basically that's what happens because it's being stored on a server that IBM, like, what is blockchain about? Well, it, it, like, I, they, 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 I heard them tout this as blockchain, but I really don't, don't see what, the, what, what is blockchain-y about it. I mean, it's basically. So who wants, to take, who wants to take the other side, Raheem? Oh. I know James, you're not taking the other side of James. I think this is a bit controversial, but when I was in the UK a couple of years ago, there was some activists talking about the origin of weapons in some areas where weapons have been smuggled in some war zones. The point of origin in this case would be the, de the developed world, which is going to be the US, UK, France. <coughs> if you can trace the origin of the weapon, then in war zones, you could know how did it end up there, and you can stop maybe. Sure. But you, know, but you need know. to trust the data entry in the first place. Yeah. You, you do have that. The point of origin in this case is not, not trusted. It would be trusted because it would be manufacturers, and most of the manufacturers yeah. would be I'm, in. I'm going to hold off because I want to get Tom, and then I'm going to give you a reply, James. 
Tom? Yeah, so I, I'm on the other side. I think it works, and it sort of goes back to Aline's original question of whether or not this is about addressing fraud or addressing the efficiency of the system. The data entry is the same. I mean, if the data entry from a paper system or a non-blockchain digital system or a blockchain system is bad, then it's, it's always going to be bad. But if it's good, if it's as good as it is right now and probably as good as it's going to be short of like RFID chipping every individual product, then what it does is allow that same record to go through the entire supply chain. And so what is deemed by whatever data input system to be a conflict-free diamond is seen by De Beers, the exporter, the producer, the, the port, the ultimate uh, importer of the good. And so you can save what are now verification costs in terms of time by processing a, a railway receipt, a trucking receipt, a shipping receipt, a forwarding exchange receipt by making that same document viewable and immutable to all of the partners on the chain. And to Shimon's question, I think you've framed the right question basically, well, why not just a traditional database? IBM is the software provider of Hyperledger Fabric. <coughs> Uh, why not just give the information to IBM? And, and in fact, maybe that's what Walmart is doing, is what yeah, you said. That, that, I, I haven't dug deeply enough. And often when you dig into these websites and the news articles and the white papers, you can't quite tell how they're using IBM. IBM, I think, has 1,500 people in their division that does Hyperledger projects. So they, they're, they're out there. IBM is, is marketing this. Um, but I think the theory, at least, because I'm not going to be uh, able to answer what Walmart's really doing, the theory is, is it's more censorship resistant, that the data is actually shared on multiple nodes, even if it's permissioned, even if there's only 15 or 20 nodes or 30 <coughs> uh, nodes, that it's more censorship resistant than if it's all stored on an IBM server. And I don't know the answer whether the Walmart is actually stored on 30 different nodes, but if it were, then, it, then arguably then, even though it's permissioned and private, it's more censorship resistant and you can have more uh, assurance um, around this. One of the challenges, of Viva left the room on interoperability, is this, this number two, trans lens, trade lens, the IBM and uh, Marx, Merx, what's it, how do you pronounce the company? Merx. Merx. It's one of the largest, it's one of the two or three largest shipping companies in the entire world. They come up with a project. They announce it, tout it, it's over a year and a half ago. There's no adoption because the other shipping companies are saying, why do I want to adopt something with you? That would be one thing if some neutral standard setter almost like in the internet, the ICANN or something, but some neutral standard setter came up with a consortium. But all the other shippers in the world say, I don't want to give up to MERS my data, my information, and what might be also market power. Um, so interoperability works there as well. Um, all right, uh, James wants to have a re reply, uh, but uh, are you all right holding off? Sure. All right, so we'll take two from my right. I think there's another issue which is more about the economics of it, which is, okay, let's, let's say that uh, Walmart adopts, uh, like you, you basically they, right now they can force uh, a lot of the supply chain to adopt this. I mean, there's a real question about uh, what they're gonna do with that data, right? Because essentially what it does, it allows them access to the end producer. So the, the, the production of mangoes is very fragmented, right? But then it get consolidated. So, so the, the, the multiple steps along the chain that actually extract economic value, not the growers. I mean, they're kind of screwed, right? Um, but if now Walmart can go directly to, to the growers because now they have access to the data of who the grower is, what their productivity is, uh, how much they produce, at what time of the year, etc. Well, there's a, there's a question about whether, uh, whether I want to cooperate with that or how much information I want to share with that if I'm in the middle and I'm actually extracting economic rent right now. Right. So if the whole supply chain is, is somehow... No, it's not just administrative. That's what I'm, that's yeah, what I'm that's right. The, the data, just like Facebook collects data or Visa collects data, that maybe Walmart would collect data. My question takes the Walmart example a little bit further. I'm curious to understand, do you 
Would a supplier early on in the process, say a firm or something selling to Walmart, do they even have exposure in terms of the user experience that they are on blockchain or does this just become the back end? And no. Like I, I guess I understand I, what we've talked about in terms of private keys for digital currency. I'm trying to connect how that ties to the user experience. They, don't, they have like the scanners that they basically scan and, or the, their phones or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you have third parties producing these linkages. They don't know basically where this data is going. So I'm not as, I, I'm going to take Shimon's description of it. I'm not as close to the Walmart. I think in the trade finance side, the consortium that these and these, um, uh, the importer, the exporter, the banks, the shippers, in the best of, in the best of these are meant to have a lot of involvement and exposure because even even though this looks pretty complicated, and it is, um, they're large institutions. They're banks, they're shippers, they're freight forwarders, uh, except for maybe the small, medium-sized enterprises in Ethiopia, but then they're an importer that needs to have involvement. I think on the supply chain side, the Walmart, an individual grower of mango, I, uh, you're saying, from your understanding, Walmart's not looking yeah, for that. Yeah, this, this is out there, they're proud of, the, of, of that. They're proud of the fact that they can actually implement it. The reason why they can implement it, because they have the sort of the, the, the last mile uh, is very simple. But they would have to have some way to do what Tom said. They have to be able to put into digital form the physical asset. The mangoes are from this. Yeah, but they can Hector, use like the cell phone, you know. So yeah, you something. type in, okay, so you know, like a scan, a, yeah, or a, a scan QR or something. Code like or something. James, you want to reply, what and then we'll go back to you. Yeah. Quick points, I think. Are you convinced yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think ultimately, there's no doubt that once a digital record's created, the digital immutability, whether it's a blockchain or a very secure, standardized, standard. Um, uh, traditional database, they are going to be the same. Uh, the digital records, is, it's fine. But in the physical world, it's in, in the context of supply chain, whether it's from the origin or any other individuals along the chain, all it takes is one bad actor to do something to the physical good. But while your digital record is immutable, your link between the physical and the digital is not guaranteed. So I still don't see how a, a physical commodity can be guaranteed to go from one end to the other of the supply chain without ever being tampered or altered. That, that is still a big question for me. Uh, 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 Hugo. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say that. I don't know if that's the objective. Uh, mm -hmm. Because like, if you take diamonds, right? And as long as you, like, what people care about when they're buying their diamonds is just the origin. Right. But my point is that it doesn't stop anyone along the supply chain to it just have makes it, it just have makes it more expensive. Pay. Possibly, see, right? but, 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 see, I think you're holding it up to up too high a standard. Yeah, exactly. Because even the oil, let's go back, not diamonds, but oil, for quite some time, you could have a bill of lading and then sell it. And as I mentioned earlier, for the 20 days that things are coming from the Mideast to Houston, that might transact 20 times, 100 times today in 2018 markets. And nobody's actually looking to see whether the oil has been somehow siphoned off the ship and it's no longer there. So there are aspects of trust that would still be in the system with somebody certifying when, when the ship is, uh, I don't remember the word, but on board when the oil's put on the ship and, when, and it comes off and there's, there's validations at those moments that would then um, communicate to the digital records. But I guess that's my And point. you could do that through inspections of diamonds. I don't think you're going to change that. I think that's still going to be poor. So but what you can do is, Aline's earlier point, you can lower a lot of the cost. You can have a, drive a lot of efficiency. And you can probably lower the fraud around the documents. Yeah, so I guess my, what, my, I guess what I'm saying okay. is I, and then we're the, if the trust isn't there in the first place or you have to rely on some other trust, what exactly is blockchain adding in terms of the physical and the digital records? But that, that's what I'm finding difficult to align. But I, I think I'll finish off with a quick point on, I spoke to someone at the conference on Pixel Mobile since we're talking oil, 
and he does the supply chain and implementation of blockchain. And I challenged him, why not use a standardized you know, database? And he said, well, it's because if you're going to get everyone along the chain to upgrade to a new system, it's far easier by telling them, oh, it's blockchain, rather than saying, well, I have a sophisticated right, database. Right. So it's I'm going to hold that point. I'm, a, I'm agreeing with that point, but we had uh, Dan and Jay. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, I, I feel like this is way more feasible uh, for smaller kind of maybe vertical, uh, integrated, vertically integrated supply chains, where like for De Beers, where like they own every kind of step of the process, and therefore you can kind of, you can, you can really trust and, and trace kind of the, the, the flow of the product. But something for like a, a, a groceries where you have kind of farmers all over the world and you know, there's seasonality, right? changing so there's just so many smaller shops that like i can't ever see it being feasible for them to adopt kind of a high level technology uh, you might well be right um, uh, though qr codes have been adopted in millions of retail establishments when 20 years ago it was kind of like what's this all about and in fact 30 years ago uh, 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 he, he's in the news because he just passed away but President uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, what some people say part of the reason he lost the election in 1992 was that he didn't know what a scanner was in a grocery store. And he was president of the United States. Can you imagine that? But he didn't because he grew up in an era and it was happening while he was in the White House. And now you, you couldn't imagine not knowing what a scanner is. So a do I agree with you, but what's happening in 20 years is sometimes hard to predict. Uh, yeah, well, to build on that a little bit, I think if you are completely vertical, then you don't really need blockchain in the first place because you have your own database, you're tracking everything as it goes through that. The reason you need blockchain is for the traceability when you have 20 different parties. Um, but also, when once you digitalize this whole thing, I mean, right now it's all paperwork, so you, you bring it, like, the digitalization is going to allow you to use other tools like IoT, so you can maybe use, to take the diamond example, use computer vision to actually like tell that you have the exact diamond you started with at the end of the supply chain. Um, or with food that you can you know, test the temperature of food and things like that. So it's, it's about quality as well. And by the way, you can ha use, remember that stuff, that broccoli at the beginning? You can use cryptographic hashes also to take pictures, to take other data about the diamond, other data about the foods. I was just gonna add, um, especially with the diamonds one, I got kind of riled up reading the article because we all know De Beers is like what, they're the best marketers you know in the world they convinced every woman that they need a diamond in their life like they invented the concept of like a diamond engagement ring so i think like this was the perfect marketing ploy to say they needed blockchain for diamonds like the entire like De Beers the entire diamond uh, like industry and how they now receive diamonds is already completely regulated and um, like they brought it all in-house and controlled by them because of the backlash against like conflict uh, diamonds from conflict zone or conflict um, originated diamonds. So for me, it just seems like a big marketing scheme that you know they already feel like they have this under control. But um, in order to like buy more consumer confidence, they're using yeah. a jazzy game. And, and, and I think you, you land upon a point about marketing, and James has said it earlier a little bit, all these insurance uh, oil executives says, well, it's the only way I'm going to get broad adoption is if I call this blockchain. Um, and that might be true even of the Australian Stock Exchange, even though I think there's a real use case there, um, but, but it's about adoption. Now, De Beers might be doing it because they want to sell more diamonds. The oil executive might be doing it because he just wants to get rid of a legacy system, or the Australian Stock Exchange might say, this is the only way I can get investment in, a, in getting rid of a legacy system, because I can either scare my board of directors and say we have to do blockchain, or I can inspire my board of directors by saying I have to use blockchain. But nonetheless, blockchain technology will have some adoption and I think it will have more adoption, though it's more ripe for adoption, and I'm going to turn to this again, you know where I'm going. It's like, yep, yep, you know, cost and benefits. These are, you know, I'm doing this as a favor for all of you, too, because you're all writing your final projects. But it's really about, um, it's going to be where there's multiple parties involved in data, and that that data represents some property right.
some either money in a dematerialized way, it's easier to envision if it's money versus security, money versus something dematerialized. It's a little harder, as we've done today, on the supply chain when it's against a physical asset. Um, but if there's multiple parties and where verification matters, where verification costs, you can probably drive some efficiency with a blockchain technology solution. Good question. Shimon raises, well, wait a minute. Maybe you're just shipping the data to IBM. Are you really shipping it to just, well, that's called a traditional database, a distributed database, or do you get something out of censorship resistance and if it's truly shared in 20, 30, 50, or 100 places? Do you lower, as the Australian Stock Exchange really does believe they'll do, lower reconciliation costs, which is, again, a, a way to drive efficiency, but there, I can't remember the number, there are 77 member companies can all have a shared ledger uh, and then lower the cost of reconciliation. It's still what somewhat controlled, those 77, it's not a public blockchain like Bitcoin. Um, so whether it's the two groups uh, that, are, that are here today that are doing trade finance, and you have a harder challenge, by the way, because you've got to go beyond this lecture, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Alpha's going, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, but or if you're doing commercial or consumer finance or real estate or what, whatever, the, and there were some really interesting projects amongst you, just thinking about where is that value add, what verification and networking costs are going to be lowered, uh, what's the competition doing? Figure out if there's any consortium doing whatever you're proposing to do. Or is there any of the three to 5,000 white papers, was there any ICO token? And then if you want to do a slap down and say why what they're doing is foolish and doesn't work, and you're doing something better, or you just want to learn, just please don't plagiarize. But just you know, look at what the competition's doing uh, as well. And why isn't a pen-only log uh, you know, the right way to go? Ilan. What about competitors who are incumbents? Absolutely. So you're, you're still doing the mortgage product, right? I didn't know if you changed. Um, yeah, what, what's happening in the mortgage market? How, how's it being, whether it's securitized or, or underwritten, and uh, whether it's traditional database management? But, but it's also in, interesting to know if anyone else is trying to look at either permissioned or permissionless systems and where you fit in to that. Because um, you're actually trying to raise money on this, if I remember. Yeah. yeah so, so to the extent you're going to raise money, those venture capitalists are going to be asking tougher questions than I'll ever be asking. I, I hope. I hope they don't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I got it. You want cheap money? You want me to be the toughie? Yeah. All right. Um, and um, you know, what are the trade-offs? I'm not asking any of you to solve scalability and performance. Some of the scalability and performance issues won't be solved for five or 10 years. But at least note them. At least say, hey, this won't work until this is solved or something like that. Thursday, we're going to do um, identity. I can't remember. Is anybody doing projects on identity? That's, you're, you're together, right? You're, yeah, all right. Be ready to chat on Thursday and share, share where you are. Kelly's looking like you're going to be sick on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be here. Um, and uh, how many of you are going to get your MIT diploma on a blockchain? Do we have an option? They do. Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, it's in my do we get an option of not getting one? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, you mean you think you have to? I think it's done for you. Oh, it's done for you. All right, there you go. What's that? You excited by that? Um, do you think you can finance off of it, though? Um, so trade finance, $17 trillion. It's a real, very significant role that financing this $17 trillion of trade. Um, lots of people involved. Sort of ripe for blockchain technology. A lot of consortiums and projects under the way, underway. Um, but they're almost all permission systems with a couple of exceptions. Um, but it feels like it's a catalyst for change. I think that even if it's just simply because it's the way to get adoption, um, and I'm talking about trade finance, 
And then there's this related part of the supply chain uh, management and so forth. Any other questions or are we breaking early? What do you, you want? Anything? All right, we'll break early. Great. <laughs>